welcome and the, the idea behind this talk, and it's going to be a relatively short talk, because I often give it as a keynote, is we as security need better ways to engage with the business that we support and work with. And so I use the metaphor of the seat at the table as something that we all want and often don't have. And so, so a little bit about me, a little bit about me. I have a presentation remote that doesn't work. Um, that's not the most important thing about me. Um, I wrote a book on threat modeling. I created a game, Elevation of Privilege, to help people threat model. And tomorrow, uh, Mark, Mark Vinkovitz and I are going to be speaking about an extension to that game that he has created. I helped create the CVE. I'm on the review board at Black Hat. And so, so to, to frame this, I was really motivated by the Open Security Summit, which some years is the OWASP Security Summit, who, said, who used this as their tagline last year. They said, we passionately believe the hard problems and challenges that our industry faces can only be solved by working together in a collaborative and open environment. And I said, huh. I really like that statement. What does that mean? How do I make that concrete? How do I make that actionable? And I said, what does working together look like? And I found these two pictures, right? On one side, people are leaning in, they're talking with, an, with each other, they're engaged. And on the other side, they're not, right? Which of these do you wanna be at? Which of these makes sense for you? Um, but when I think about my career in security and I think about which table I sit at more often, far more often, it's the table on the table on your right. There we go, the table on your right. And that's not very good. It's not an engaged place. And so as I was thinking about this, I saw some writing by John Allspaw, who was the CTO at Etsy. And he talks about the, dif the distinction between dialogue and discussion. That dialogue is fluid. It's about prototyping. It's about experimenting. It's about exploring ideas and their consequences. It involves phrases like, what if, or how about. And then as time goes by, we go from dialogue, from this exploration, to a decision, a discussion, where we're going to fix ideas, we're going to create production quality code, we're going to commit to one idea and not the others. And that, is the table that I think we as security professionals want to be at. We don't want to be at the table once everything is decided and we're saying, holy cow, what did you do? And so that, that brings me to the idea of design. And frankly, design is a dirty word, right? Nobody likes to talk about design. We're all super agile. We don't do these architecture things. But design is happening anyway. It's an ongoing process. It's a process where someone says, huh, I wonder what database we should use. I wonder how we should connect to this API. I wonder how we should whatever it is, we're, how we authenticate users. And this discussion happens around, a, this dialogue, excuse me, happens around a table where we're thinking about what happens, we make some decisions, and then it gets to review. And this is tied, for those of you who work at large companies, to models like RACI, responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed, right? And security is often informed Sometimes we're consulted, but the really interesting decisions are being made at the responsible and accountable end. And then we're told what they are. That's not where we want to be. 
And when we think about the table, seating is limited. And these are just a couple of headlines I pulled um, from searches for the words, a seat at the table, right? There's quality, there's IT, there's users. Everyone wants, excuse me, everyone wants a seat at the table. And because of that, you end up with tables that look like the one that was on the left, big, lots of people, nothing actually gets done. And then there's a side group that actually goes off and makes the decisions and figures out what you're gonna do. And, that, and the reason for that is, comes to us from social psychology. Smaller groups can align better. Smaller teams will work together better than larger ones. And so today, security doesn't play at the table. We say things like, that would be insecure. We'll run a vuln scan. Well, if your answer, if your means of arguing for a seat at the table is to say, we'll run a Vuln scan, we don't need you there. I don't need you to tell me that thing that you say in every meeting, right? Okay, great. I know what security is going to say. That would be insecure, or we'll run a Vuln scan, or we'll make sure we've got some static analysis in place, right? Let's be optimistic, we'll fuzz that. Okay, so you're gonna fuzz these things. We'll, we know what you're going to do, and we don't need to give you a seat at the table. Now, it's not entirely true that security never plays at the table. Um, those of you who have seen some of my talks in the past may have noticed a propensity to use uh, Star Wars imagery. Um, and so security does occasionally play at the table, but this is not the deal we're looking for. Um, and, and so there was, a, there was a quote from Simon Bennett's, this was a tweet uh, a couple of years ago that just blew me away. Simon runs the ZA proxy project. And he said he got this static analysis security testing report with 1,934 vulnerabilities that somebody wanted him to go do something about. And it came in as a PDF. <laughs> Thanks, security. I appreciate it. Um, let, me, let, let me file this in this file right over here next to my desk. Um, but this is the perception that exists. And this is not the perception that we want. It's not the perception that we need <coughs> Sorry. It's not the perception that we need if we want a seat at the table. So what do we need? We need tools that work in dialogue. We need tools that work when things are fluid, not fixed. We need consistency. We need some soft skills. And when I say consistency, security has a reputation. Ask two security experts, get three different versions of no. Okay, so why am I giving you a seat at the table if not to pick on you? You show up at the table one day and you tell me to do this, and then you show up at the table the next day and you tell me to do that. I would like the same problems to get the same sorts of solutions. And we need some soft skills, right? The, the dreaded soft skills, because when you have a small table, if you have someone who doesn't play well with others, you're not gonna get invited back. And so, when I think about tools that work in dialogue, I think a lot about threat modeling. Again, I'm sure you're surprised by this. Um, but this is, this is the reason I gravitate to threat modeling as a tool set because it helps us get to that position we want to be at. It helps us get to the table. And so briefly, threat modeling has four questions. What are we working on? What can go wrong? What are we gonna do about it? Did we do a good job? And we can answer the question of what are we working on with a whiteboard diagram we can ask, answer the question of what are we working on 
with complicated wall-sized charts that are drawn by the graphics team in Photoshop and made available so everyone knows how things go. When we ask what can go wrong, it's tools like Stride, Kill Chain, KPEC that help us answer this question in a consistent way, in a repeatable way, in a predictable way. And so by asking these questions, what are we working on, what can go wrong, security can engage and participate in answering the question, what are we gonna do about it, when not a line of code has been written, when there's an opportunity to really influence or change what's happening, re-architect rather than uh, use a little bit of duct tape. And the, the question of did we do a good job, I was having a conversation uh, earlier, is not just did we do it, did we threat model well, but also as a chance to retrospect, to say did we, did we get value out of this, what do we keep doing, what do we do differently, so that your process evolves because the agile world loves to retrospect. They love to say, did we do that well? What, what are we going to do a little bit differently or a lot differently next time so it works better? And so threat modeling gives us a toolkit to engage at the table, and then that structure allows us to have consistency. If what we're gonna do is we're gonna brainstorm, then I might come up with one set of threats you might come up with another, you might come up with a third. If we use stride to structure our thinking, if we use the kill chain or some kill chain variant to structure our thinking, then we get much less of the ask two experts get three answers problem. It also allows us to bring people with different experience and different skills to the table. So it's not, I know you, I like you, therefore you can come to our meetings. It's security getting to be in the meetings and participate in these discussions. Um, and I talked about the mechanism and structure point, I'm not gonna reiterate, but that consistency really does drive collaboration if if you had, I don't know, an accountant and you brought them your taxes each year and you said, you know, my tax bill last year was $10,000 less than it is this year, what's up? And their answer was, I don't know, I put some numbers in the thing, I got different numbers this year. You'd be like, thank you very much, I'm gonna find myself a new accountant. If we as security people want to engage, we can't be in that. And I'm, I'm reiterating that, I'm hammering on it because it's a fundamental lesson that I have learned. It's a fundamental part of my practice. So the other thing I wanna say about threat modeling is it's a big tent. Like developing software, there are lots of tasks, tools, deliverables, skills that you bring to bear Right, so I can have a waterfall process where I'm using the Microsoft Visual C compiler to compile C++ code into a product that's, I don't know, an operating system. Or I can have a CI CD pipeline where I'm using Jenkins and Gherkin to commit and publish my code 50 times a day. Both are developing software. Similarly, I can have a threat modeling approach, which is lightweight, agile, fast, low effort, or I can have one that's big and complicated and slow, and which one makes sense varies with the project I'm on, but there's a big tent. And if you think of threat modeling as a single thing, as a single way to do it, then you don't have building blocks, you don't have microservices where you say, oh, I'm gonna hand, there's some really interesting work that people are doing. Um, ironically, speaking directly opposite me right now, um, Omar Lev Haroni, is that how I pronounce his name? 
just published a blog post on threat modeling as code. And Fraser Scott is doing some stuff with threat modeling as code where they are saying, let's build services that help us automate this work. Whether the services are software services or human delivered, if you think about threat modeling as small blocks, it gets much more flexible and it allows you to engage in new and powerful ways which are about engagement early on rather than review. So that's sort of well and good, or I hope it's all well and good, but we still need the soft skills. And, you know, people, people hate talking about soft skills at security conferences because they're ill-defined. We don't know what we mean. Um, but I can tell you what I don't mean. I don't mean this, right? This is funny. Okay, we, we can all laugh that the DevOps unicorn poops and security goes and cleans it up. Um, but the reality is, if I show this to a DevOps person and I say, you're producing this stream of excrement that I'm cleaning up, um, I don't know, am I insulting him two times or three? Am I insulting her two times or three in that short little sentence? Um, so while this is funny, it doesn't help us get our jobs done. And so I want to talk about a few soft skills that I think are important as we go for that seat at the table. But before I do, I want to address a concern that happens with soft skills, which is that all of these are unnatural when you start. And in fact, nothing we do in our day is natural. I mean, look at this. This is a totally weird room, let's be honest, right? You all are sitting there as I talk for now 17 minutes and none of you have said anything. How weird is that, right? It's unnatural. Um, but it is a, there is a norm around how this happens where you all listen politely and then pretend to have liked it and clap and then ask hard questions at the end. Um, and that's the expectation, but it's not natural. We need to learn and practice this. We need, some of you may want to interject with comments, right? And you have learned over time to hold those comments to yourself until the end. Similarly, with the soft skills that I'm going to talk about, they don't feel like the natural thing for you to do all the time. We have to practice them. We have to learn how to do them. And one of these is respect the person who's speaking. Pay attention, don't interrupt, don't read your email, don't have a lot of side conversations, because when you're reading your email and having side conversations, the message you are sending is, what you're saying is irrelevant to me. I am more interested in this, uh, oh, actually I got an email, right? No, I don't, right, but it would be, my respect for you includes I've taken my phone out of my pocket. I don't have email on my screen distracting me as I speak. And so we need to pay attention to the people who are speaking. We also need to pay attention to the people who are not speaking. We have a lot of people in our industry who are, for whatever reason, very vocal and very loud. And sometimes they drown out other voices and we don't hear from everyone in the room. And that's, that's a shame. We should. Um, and we should invite them to speak. We should invite them to express themselves both here at this conference, which is, again, a little weird since I'm the one speaking, not you, um, but also at work. We should make sure that we're engaging with everyone who might have something to add. If not, why are we paying them a salary? Right? If they don't get a chance to speak up and contribute, what are, what are they there for? Closely related is active listening. Show that you're listening. Use body language. Use gestures. The, the phrase which is difficult to use, it can feel really plastic. I hear you saying, and then reflect back some of what they just told you. Right? When people are saying these things, 
defer your judgment. Listen to everything they have to say. Don't start out, don't hear the first 10 words and start planning how you're gonna shoot them down or cut them off at the knees. And respond to what they say in an appropriate way. Lastly, assuming good intent. It may be a shock to you, but I'm almost 100% positive that no one at your job is paid to make your life more difficult. It's true. They are paid to do other things like ship features or operate products or do some marketing, and they're trying to get their job done the same way you are. And so when someone around me says something really dumb, I ask myself, what belief could possibly lead them to sound like such an idiot? I don't ask them that, I ask me that. And oftentimes, I discover that there's a, there are real beliefs that underlie these questions that are valid. Um, I was doing a training course for someone and they wanted me to write some scripts for the training course. And so I sent off the scripts and there was a bunch of nice feedback and then someone said, um, how do you draw a picture? I'm like, in my head, I was like, seriously? You're seriously asking me how to draw a picture? I, 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 and it took me a little while to be able to respond politely and appropriately. And what I realized is that they actually weren't sure what, they, what the items they should be drawing are, right? Should they draw a class diagram or a data flow diagram? Should they draw wireframes of the software they're gonna ship? And I hadn't really been specific. And so despite my initial reaction of, I'm getting, I'm getting played here, this is so annoying, it turned out to be a good question and it turned out to be a good improvement to the thing that I delivered to them. And I got there by assuming that they had good intent. Now, Related to all of these, the soft skills, the inclusion, brings us to the subject of diversity. And I happen to believe that diversity is an intrinsic good, that we are all better off when, people can br when we have people with skills, with aptitudes, with knowledge, who are not excluded on the basis of physical attributes about them, but we take advantage of and engage with all the people around us who have something to contribute. Now, I have that belief that diversity is an intrinsic good, and you may agree or disagree with me. That's your call. I'm not gonna try and sell you that diversity is an intrinsic good, really, because I also believe that security is an intrinsic good, and we should make secure things. And what I have learned working with a lot of executives is that I get further with a business case than I do with a sermon. And so whether or not I believe that diversity is good, I believe that executives will pay more attention to a business case, and the better I make a business case, the better off I'm going to get what I want. And so for me, the business case for soft skills is also the business case for diversity, that if we are welcoming, if we are engaging, then we will have more people wanting to work with us. We will be able to win that seat at the table because the behaviors that drive people away drive people away in all sorts of ways. And some of those, um, some of those are going to drive people away because they don't feel welcome as security professionals. Some of those we're going to see people are driven away because they don't like working with us because we don't listen to them, we don't respect them, and we don't assume they have good intentions. And so I think that the same sorts of ways in which we can improve our behaviors so that we get this seat at the table will also help us get towards an important diversity goal. So I said this was going to be short, I was telling you the truth. Um, I could have padded this. Would anyone like me to have padded this talk? No, I didn't think so. Um, so to summarize, if we're going to win a seat at the table, we need some tools. 
Agile threat modeling is one of those tools. We need to be consistent in the way in which we as security professionals and security teams engage with the businesses around us. And we need to work on our soft skills so that we're better able to work with the human beings who are around us. With that, I just want to say thank you for your time. I hope this was useful and interesting to you. Um, and so thank you. And I'm happy to take questions now, or if you want to talk via email, happy to do that. So again, thank you. For, yes. So oh. you have a, a large existing system, it's going to have a change made to it. Mm -hmm. So, so I'll go back to the four questions. What are we working on? Threat model, exactly that. And this drives me as a security person nuts, right? There's all this other unknown stuff. But if you try and take on that unknown stuff, there's no budget to fix it. There's no will to look at it. There's no time to do that. So what are we working on? That small little change is what you should threat model. And then you accumulate some security debt which the team can learn to pay down later. What? Oh, yes. What do you think about the rest of the orbs actually care about security because something's happened and now they're telling us all the time we almost have to say that every table yeah, yeah. Um, so actually, let me, I, so I should repeat the question back for the, for the video. Um, sorry for not doing that on the previous one. And so the question is, what about orgs that have had some sort of event or trauma, and now people are coming to the security team all the time, and it's a little overwhelming? Um, I, I, I sort of hate to say it, but I will. It's training. It is teach them to fish, um, F-I-S-H, um, or teach them to fish, P-H-I, um, right? So that they learn these things and can start to stand on their own. The reason I created the Elevation of Privilege card game is to teach people how to threat model and to draw them into it. And it gives them a structure for starting to think about these things so that they can start to stand on their own two feet, so that they can fish on their own. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. All right. Oh, actually, we've got a question back here. Yeah, Since yeah I'm wondering if you could sort of explain a little bit more uh, threat model. Thank you. Uh, because I think that there's a lot of people that are interested in threat models. Yes. So, so honestly, I would refer you to Omer's blog post, which I linked to on my blog, adamshowstack.org slash blog yesterday. But the idea is to be able to say, we know that there is a spoofing attack possible here. And so we're going to write some tests in BDD to encapsulate that idea and drive test activity from it so that the ideas that we come up with in our threat modeling work become automated tests so that we can see that there are no changes. Or we might say, oh, I don't know, our elastic search engine should not be open to the internet, so we'll write an automated test for an information disclosure threat that spins up an AWS instance in some other account, reaches out, tries to get the data, and so the question, which I neglected, is could you describe threat modeling as code more? There's a talk uh, at PM by Isar uh, on that. Isar, raise your hand. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so go to Isar's talk then. <laughs> All right, so yes. So you talked about the four things in threat modeling. Did you think we could do a good job? How do you measure that? So, so you start out with, did we actually do the tasks, right? Do we have a diagram? And the question is, how do we measure if we did a good job? Um, do we have a diagram? Did we find threats against this? Did we file bugs, use case, uh, uh, user stories, acceptance tests for each of the things we found? 
right? So that's a very mechanical, did we execute the task? Then you can, you can do a retrospective. You can say, how did people feel about the work? Were they confident in it? Are they happy they spent the time on it? Do they feel it paid off well? Um, measuring a lot of this activity is just as, is even trickier than measuring software development overall. And so we've got the mechanical ones and the how did you feel ones and not a lot in between. Okay, uh, yes. So the question is what's the business case and how do I put it in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs? I think if you don't threat model, it is very hard to argue that your security program is systematic, comprehensive, and sy systematic, structured, comprehensive. Sorry, I meant to clarify the yeah. soft skills part, not the Oh, the soft skills part. Yeah. Um, so I think the business case is around escalations and difficulty in engaging. It's, I go to his R and I say, man, I can't deal with this Jonathan guy anymore. He comes in, he yells at me, he tells me that my code is no good, that I'm shipping insecure crap. He's disrespectful. Can you please get me someone else, right? And so it's the escalations, it's the failure to collaborate, it's, frankly, it's potentially hostile work environments. Um, and so those things come together to make the case for the soft skills. And let's make this a, oh, um, let's take two last questions because I appreciate all of you sitting here um, and I'm happy to talk, but I'd like to move it from a, you know, you ask, I answer on camera sort of thing to let's sit around and actually have a conversation. Because um, as I said, feel sort of unnatural. So I will take your question and your question. So the question is, how do you make a business case for more training and especially so, um, secure, coding. secure coding practices? So I would say that the threat that we can, we, and you know, I don't know that we need to use the threat modeling frame here necessarily, but the threat is the developers will accidentally introduce insecurity, vulnerabilities into the code. And so once they have done that and the code gets tested, delivered, dependencies are taken on it, it becomes expensive to fix, it becomes expensive to go back. And so training can help you reduce rework. It can help you improve the predict, excuse me, improve the predictability of schedules because you're less likely to have um, problems discovered at the last minute or beyond, you know, the last minute before ship or weeks, days, months after ship, right? No, no one likes to be in a project and be told, hey, you know that feature you were working on? Well, you have to go fix code you wrote three months ago because we found operational vulns in it it messes up the new project, and so that's part of the business case for doing it better the first time. Does that make sense? Yes, I think that would like. So that's a great point, is measurement and metrics so that as you're rolling out the training, you can actually show we're finding this many fewer things with static analysis, with pen test, um, and you can actually measure some of the degree of rework that's being done. If you're rolling out training, you might be able to do that and make that, make that work. Thank you. Thank you. And last question. So, so the question is about having a large threat model and multiple people at different levels of resolution and different scales and how you bring them together. And I would go back to the seat at the table it's collaboration, it's listening. It is using the threat model as the thing to which you can point so I can say, I'm building this overall system and Joe owns this, this component that sends password reset mails and Alice owns 
the um, machine learning piece which figures out what products to present to people or whatever it is. And so Alice would say, huh, I don't see my machine learning piece in your big diagram. Let's get it in there so we can show what connects to what. And then she does that smaller threat model and then you use the dialogue about how is the system evolving as the thing that brings it together. Because a lot of this and a lot of software development, right? We think about software development is the person behind the keyboard writing code. But when sociologists and anthropologists study how developers spend their days, it's an awful lot of talking to one another about design decisions, big and small. What, why does this code work like this? How do I debug this bug? What's going on here? And threat modeling gives security an entry into those sorts of conversations. And so while well, we desire to, and I'm excited by, the efforts to make it more automated, more code driven, I think there is a communications aspect which we need to think about in parallel. So um, with that, I am happy to continue answering questions. I shall not be offended if you'd like to go do other things. And thank you again for your time and attention.